Hello, and welcome to another session. Uh, my name is Leon, and I'll be your host in the upcoming couple of sessions. Uh, thank you for following us today and our sponsor for making this event possible. Uh, also, a huge, huge, huge thanks uh, to the person who we are here to see and hear, uh, Ugo Penedonish. Hi, Ugo. How are you doing? Great. And you, Leon? I'm really good. Sunny here in Belgium. Uh, I heard that you recently moved back to Portugal. How does it feel like to come back? Exactly. It's great to be back. I spent about three, uh, 13 years abroad after I finished my studies in Porto. And now I'm back to be part of this exciting machine learning community in Portugal. <laughs> Great. Um, so Ugo will uh, do his talk about reinforcement learning and long-term value prediction. Uh, just before we start, uh, feel free to ask questions on our YouTube channel or on the Slack channel. And also feel free to react to any of those questions and comment on anything that pops up on Slack. Ugo, the floor is yours. Good luck. Thank you. OK, so uh, the plan for today, uh, given that we have about 50 minutes, it's to split my talk into Three main sections. The first one, I will give you kind of an introduction about reinforcement learning, a review about the problem set up, the main concept, and some uh, well-established algorithms. And then I will uh, move on into what was my area of research in the last uh, couple of years, jointly with colleagues from DeepMind and Lambda and, and Google Brain in Zurich, um, which is about a sub-problem of reinforcement learning that you will uh, learn about later. And then we'll have some time uh, at the end in which I will give you a few pointers on how to learn more about this, how you can apply RL to some uh, real world problems and let, leave you time to do some questions. So you probably heard about reinforcement learning due to a, a wave of recent successes in the last five or six years. And they were mostly ap applied to games. So uh, the game of uh, Atari, there's a, a console with the 57 different games, uh, the game of Go, which is a board strategy game, and other games that became also uh, quite popular, like StarCraft, Dota, and so on. But given that uh, I'm not assuming that you have a background in reinforcement learning, I want to start by contrasting it to other uh, problems of machine learning that you are more used to it, to, more used to, like supervised learning. So in supervised learning, you typically want to learn a complex function uh, uh, from data. So for example, if you want to distinguish images of uh, cats from dogs, uh, you would construct a data set, and then you would have uh, a process of uh, training your function approximator like a neural network by uh, constructing a loss function that you say, oh, is my prediction close to my expected output? And learning is basically the optimization process in which you are minimizing this loss and your output is getting closer and closer to what you expect from your label data. But machine learning is a bit broader, right? So it includes uh, what we just said, supervised learning. It also includes unsupervised learning in which you have data without labels and you just, find, just want to find some hidden structure of the data. It also includes the problem that is not very popular of self-supervised learning in which originally you have uh, data without labels, a bit like an unsupervised learning, but you are able to derive labels automatically. For example, if you have a sequence like a video and you want to predict, let's say, the next frames from the previous ones, you're, you kind of automatically derive um, annotations from uh, data that is not originally annotated by humans. And then the field of reinforcement learning, which is the one we'll focus on today, is actually a setup in which your data comes as a sequence of states annotated with the scalar rewards and possibly with also the actions that um, an agent took. So to understand how this data is generated, the, the problem setup is normally the following. You have an agent that interacts with an, with an environment, so at each step, it receives an observation. It can take uh, then an action. And then in the next step, it will get another observation and also a reward, which basically will tell it, tell the agent how well it is doing in uh, performing a specific task. So this reward can just be a, a real value, could be zero, could be positive or negative. And normally you want to maximize uh, the rewards you keep getting into the future. So again, to contrast it with the supervised learning, if you had some problem like a navigation task in which you want to go from point A to point B, 
You could still try to uh, formulate this as supervised learning, but in that case, you would need uh, to know the solution and get it annotated by humans. Uh, and for each precise location, you'd have to have a label, say, go forward at this location, then left, then forward, and so on, to get to the goal. In reinforcement learning, the setup is different. You assume you don't know this solution, and the agent has to try out by trial and errors, different directions, different actions. Uh, and the only feedback you will give to the agent is, uh, well, let's say you're getting colder, uh, warmer, let's say you're getting closer to the target, further away, and so on. And it has to figure out the solution by itself. The way uh, reinforcement learning is more formally specified is by what is called the Markov decision process. So this is a, a set of um, four main ingredients. So S is the set of states that are allowed in your system. A is the set of actions that you can take as an agent. P here is the probability, is the transitions probability. So uh, it's a function that tells you given that you are in a given state and you apply a given action, you are in state S, you apply action A, what is the probability you will end up in this other state? So this encodes a bit the environment dynamics. What are the rules of physics of your system, what, what, what is going on. And in addition to that, you also uh, uh, have a, a reward function which tells you, okay, if you are in this state, you receive this reward, or can be even slightly more generic. If you are in this state, take this action and reach that state, you get this reward. Notice that there is, a, despite the fact that there are only these four main ingredients, there there's a lot of variability here. So the action space can actually be pretty small, like in Atari console, you, you can only do 18 different actions with a joystick. In Go, uh, you can do maybe 361 positions where you can put the stone, but you can have very large action spaces like in recommender systems, if you want to recommend the next video in YouTube or, or stuff like that. And in addition, they can be either discrete if there is a finite set of actions you can take or continuous like in the joints of, um, of a robot you need to control. So these are different setups. For the state space, the same thing happens. Uh, they can also be large, small, discrete, continuous. And further to that, they might be uh, fully observable or only partial observable. If you only see part of the information of the world, like what you see in front of your eyes, rather than, than the whole world, which make, also makes things harder. And uh, the environment dynamics, which is a bit encoded by those transition probabilities, could be deterministic if uh, for each time you are in a uh, given state you apply the same action you get the same outcome or it could be stochastic if you uh, the outcomes uh, could have a random component likewise for the um, the reward function they could be deterministic of, or stochastic sometimes you have situations in which by applying the same action you get different rewards this also makes uh, learning harder and you can have what is called dense or sparse rewards. So in some environments, you get rewards that are different than zero very often, like at every time step, which is which allows you to to learn relatively fast. In some domains, you you spend a lot of time getting zero rewards, so it's it's harder to to kick off learning. Okay, so given uh, this setup. There are very few concepts you need to, to learn. So one of them is what is a policy. A policy is just a function that defines our behavior. So this policy pi uh, is a probability distribution over actions that you can take given an input state or observation. And normally in RL, you want to find a good policy that takes us actions that uh, maximize your um, sum of rewards. And the sum of rewards normally is more precisely defined as what we call discounted return, which is summing the rewards you get from time t into the future, possibly with the discount factor gamma that is normally between zero and one, should be normally close to one, to give a little bit more importance to immediate rewards than, uh, than future rewards. Another uh, uh, concept that is appear very, frequently in uh, reinforcement learning. And this, we will talk a lot about those in the rest of the talk because it's very related to the research I did. So pay attention <laughs> if you can, is uh, what is a value function. And there are two uh, kinds of value functions. 
the most basic one, which is the state value function, just encodes what is the expected return you get for a given policy pi. So for a given, it's already a fixed policy. If you start from a state S and you now execute that policy into the future, what is your expected return? And very similarly, uh, what is called the action value function or a Q function is pretty almost the same as here, but now you, you introduce as an argument also the action. So you, you say, if I'm in state S and now I take action A, what is the expected return? I take action A, and then from then onwards, I behave according to the policy pi, which is fixed. What is my expected return? So this is often things that uh, uh, reinforcement learning algorithms want to estimate, because once you have this, you are able to estimate uh, your like long-term value of executing that policy. And you are also, by just doing a, a one more simple trick, try to get it better and better. So one important distinction between uh, RL classes of RL algorithms that exist is the following. Policy evaluation versus policy improvement. By evaluation, you just mean you have a fixed policy and you just want to learn this, uh, these value functions, either the state value function or the action value function. And that's it. You are not attempting to improve the policy. What most often people care about is go beyond that, which is also policy improvement, in which um, the, there is an intermediate step often in which you do policy evaluation, but then you start acting greedily according to the, the value function you estimated. So, okay, I realized that if, if I would take this other action that my policy is not recommending, that if I would take it, it would be even better. So there is often this loop of evaluating the current policy, acting greedily according to it, evaluate it again and repeat. And this leads to better and better policies. So in fact, despite the fact that deep reinforcement learning, which was the merge merging of reinforcement learning with the deep learning, so the field of deep neural networks has uh, become very popular is only in the last five or six years. The main algorithms behind reinforcement learning are not new at all. So around late eight, uh, in the late 80s, uh, there were two algorithms already for each of these uh, class of problems, for policy evaluation and for policy improvement. So TD Learning in 88 by Rich Sutton and uh, Q Learning in 89 by Watkins. However, notice here what I said, this only worked uh, very well for tabular functions. So it was not for the case of uh, neural network function approximators. By tabular functions, I mean that what you want to learn is uh, just a table with numbers. You, 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 you assume that your problem is small enough so that you can enumerate every state. You can store it just in a table and uh, you have a number like a float uh, double or whatever just for each of those states that will try to estimate its value. Uh, this would be for the value function. For the action value function, you would just have a slightly bigger table in which you would have for each possible action in that state, you try to estimate the Q value for that state and action pair. So this was working, right? And uh, in fact, the temporal difference learning algorithm, for example, uh, could almost be described with one line update tool, right? If you're just trying to estimate this uh, expected sum of returns into the future, uh, uh, certain with this uh, one line update rule, which basically uh, defines a, a recurrence relation between uh, consecutive states. It's a bit like where in the graph algorithms when you do dynamic programming for shortest paths. It's basically updating a guess from a guess. So if you have a guess for the value of the next state you, you by almost by definition by the definition of value function you can improve your current estimate by just taking a gradient step in that direction in fact the algorithm could be described be described in just a few lines of code in which you iterate over the transitions and just do this update rule. likewise for q learning in which uh, the update rule is slightly longer just now because you take into account actions and it's a q function and also because you are uh, 
acting greedily according to it to generate better functions. There is this hard argmax here over the best action that you can take in the next day. Uh, and again, the algorithm is, is, is simple. So what, what was all the, the fuss about the, in, in the last few years? Well, what happened is that at DeepMind, um, people were able around 2014 to make it, to make this work actually with neural networks for much more complex um, states or, or observations than just things that you could enumerate, right? So for example, for the Atari uh, console, you will be watching, you'll be getting the pixels of the game. So it's hundreds by hundreds of pixels and you need to take one of out the 18 actions. So now you can no longer encode, um, you can no longer store a function, uh, sorry, a table. We, for every possible state and uh, action, what would be the value? What you need to do is to have some sort of function approximation. In this, ca in this case, it would be a neural, uh, convolutional neural network to go to map directly from uh, uh, the input to the output uh, and learn the best you, you can this function. And this did not work out of the box just with Q learning because it would be unstable. So the two tricks basically that were introduced were just two. One of them was this experience replay in which transitions, in, instead of learning uh, with the latest tra uh, uh, transition that you took, like the next action uh, that you took, you would store things in a buffer, basically uh, some memory, and then you sample uniformly from that. So sometimes you will be learning with things that happened a little bit more in the past. Um, and this would make it more stable. The other thing would, was a trick called target networks in which you actually have two copies of the, um, of the Q function of the neural network you're trying to approximate. And for a given amount of steps, let's say 10,000, you freeze those while you are defining your loss function and you just update the, the other copy. And then after a while, you copy back to the target network and you do again. So this also introduces more stability in learning. Since then, a lot of progress happened, really, like, like just like last month, there was a paper called Agent 57 in the, in the lineage of uh, DQN that already includes literally dozens of more techniques. So beyond the experience replay and um, target network, now it has things like prioritize experience replay, distribu uh, distributed RL, it has more things for long term, uh, for short term memory like LSTMs, episodic memory. It has a lot of things about, uh, on how to do exploration properly. I didn't mention this before, but in RL, you need to get the balance between exploration and exploitation right. So you need to do some trial and error. There's a lot of technique going on here. And a few more uh, things that like labeled under meta controller to optimize this whole process um, better. So a lot of complexity. However, what I want to do for the rest of my talk is actually coming back to the basics. And that was uh, my research um, in the last couple of years. So I, it will mostly refer to two papers that uh, are mentioned here. One of the, well, you can find both of them in archive. The, the latest one, this one, Adaptive Temporal Difference Learning was published in NeoRIPS uh, last year which is one of the main machine learning conferences. But um, the goal was really to go back to this very fundamental problem of why is it hard to do reinforcement learning with function approximation, which was the original uh, thing the UN was trying to solve. And so I, I started wondering, do we, can we get even to a simpler setup than what the UN is trying to solve? And do the problems already exist there? And the answer, as you will see, it will be yes. So rather than uh, trying to do policy optimization or improvement like DQN is doing, like trying to find a good policy, I will restrict myself to doing just policy evaluation, like we mentioned before. It's just trying to learn the value function of a fixed policy, not try to improve the policy, that's all. Uh, instead of doing online learning like uh, DQN is doing, which is basically learning while acting, I will restrict myself to doing offline uh, learning, or it's called also batch 
RL, which means you have a pre-collected set of trajectories generated by a policy. And this is your fixed training data set. It's, it's much like in supervised learning. You are giving a data set that is already collected, is not going to change, and you can just play with that. This also simplifies the problem. It's more reproducible. And as you will see, it's still problematic in some scenarios. Another thing that it's a, a, a sort of a simplification is that we restrict ourselves to the problem, problem of on policy learning. This means that you are trying to learn the value function for a policy that is the same as the one that connected the data. A harder problem, which is called off policy learning, is the one in which you are trying to learn the value function of a policy pi, but the data that you are given was collected by a different policy. As you can imagine, this problem is much harder, right? Especially if the two policies, they differ too much. In the limit, they could do things so differently and visit uh, different uh, areas of the state space almost without no overlap. That's basically this would be impossible. But we are restricting ourselves to a scenario that is possible, which is on policy data. And our goal will be to make a precise estimation of the value function. By this, I mean uh, with low uh, mean square error of your predictions, right? You want your value function that you learn to be precise. Well, uh, I can tell you that actually uh, even simpler than uh, TD learning, there is this uh, method called Monte Carlo reduction, which is basically just uh, converting the, the policy evaluation problem into a supervised learning problem. So it's a naive thing you would do, and it's, it's actually it can be quite good. So basically what this means is that you have these trajectories, let's say they start from these states and then you run your policy, this is this state, and let's assume that you only get some rewards at the end, let's say. If you want to estimate the, the value of, let's say, state C, uh, no, let's say, no, A is more interesting, from state A, you have two trajectories that started from state A, in one of them, it ended up in this state, you ended up having a return of minus one, in this one, seven. What you would naively do, and this is the correct thing to do, is that you would estimate the, the value of A by averaging out um, the returns for different trajectories that started from it. So if you do uh, this for each of these cases, you would uh, end up with this estimate. This is basically what is called Monte Carlo regression. So it's, it's basically just pre-computing the returns and then do re the regression. What temporal uh, difference learning, the algorithm that like Sutton introduced in uh, ATA tried to do is like, can you do better than Monte Carlo regression? Well, if you if you notice some of the, um, the trajectories, some of the states, for example, if you start in state C, you only have one trajectory that started from there and you only have one measurement, you got the minus four. However, this trajectory actually intersected with other trajectories for which you have more data. So because you, you are assuming that the Markov property holds, which is if you are in a given state, all that matters is that state, the past does not count, you could do better, right? You could reuse partial information from other trajectories to help you estimate uh, this other state. So for example, in this case, um, your estimate for for, v, uh, for C would actually now become dependent of your estimate from from uh, e state uh, X, which in turn was uh, dependent on the estimate for Y, and so on. And here you benefited from a lot of intersections from other trajectories. So in fact, you could get uh, an estimate that is more precise because you exploited the Markov property, whereas in the in the Monte Carlo regression, you did not exploit that property. So it's less sample efficient, and therefore the beauty of, of TD learning. However, uh, uh, rem remember that uh, uh, this is great as long as you are dealing with the tabular um, RL. So you are representing your function in uh, just a big table of numbers. However, and this was our observation, you will see later, uh, with pretty much any kind of function approximation that you might introduce, and some of them really, really simple, 
and very close to Tableau approximation, doing temporal difference learning is no longer safe in the sense that it's not guaranteed to converge to the same solution from by Monte Carlo regression, which uh, converges to you know the right solution when you have more and more data. And to understand why, I will give you another simple example that we derived specifically for that to communicate better what is going on. And it's a simple, uh, a simple uh, Markov decision process in which you have a starting state at zero. From there, you can go from one to k states, and then some of them, the first branch, like from one to p states, go to this uh, v1 state, and in this right side of the branch, they go to b2. Then they all join here, and only at the end you get a reward. Uh, let's say that is sampled from a Gaussian, some mean and sigma. Everywhere else you get zero rewards. And then we will study two scenarios. One in which um, is basically the tabular approximation in which you can learn one parameter for each of these. And the other one, we just introduce a small uh, kind of function approximation mistake in which you are you, this, uh, the uh, value for B1 is not learnable. It's fixed to some constant. So you are bound to make a mistake in, of, on the evaluation of that state. And this is what happened. So if you, uh, this is Monte Carlo versus deep learning. If you are doing tabular learning, uh, basically TD in this case just dominates Monte Carlo. So uh, the X axis is the number of trajectories you have available. So the more data you have available, normally uh, the better you do at estimating the value function for both cases. And what you notice, however, is that Monte Carlo in the beginning with very few data will have a lot of noise because you will be estimating the values for these states and only a fraction of the trajectories pass there, right? If you have, let's say 40 of these states here, only one out of 40 trajectories pass there. So you will be, um, you will need a lot of trajectories to start having evidence for these states. And therefore in TD, because you are actually, uh, updating your guess from successor states and this B1 and B2, a lot of trajectories pass there, right? Almost everything passes there. You are able, and in Q everyone passes, you are able to bootstrap your estimates uh, for SP from the successor states, which are super precisely estimated. So that's why TD does so much better. However, if, uh, if we go back and now we say, okay, this, uh, the value for this B1 is not learnable. You need to live with the fact that it's fixed to a, a, a constant, it's some bias, and uh, that's all. Well, now TD starts to have a big problem, which is even with the infinite amount of data, the more that you get, you will still incur a big penalty because all the states S1 to SP, which are bootstrapping, are doing this TD update from the value of B1, they will be wrong because this is set to a wrong value that we cannot move. And you are estimating the value of S1 to SP from there. So all of the, these estimates will be wrong, no, much, no matter how much data you have. Whereas MC will, uh, will deal with it, right? Because it's not, uh, bootstrapping from uh, the erroneous value of state B1. There is, uh, okay, I don't go into details this, there is a, a, a variant in the literature called TD Lambda in which you can interpolate between these two approaches, but it doesn't really solve the problem because it's the Lambda, it's not like state dependent. So it's also um, not a miracle. So what we, de what we defined uh, a new algorithm that we called adaptive TD algorithm, in which basically you try to do temporal difference learning to have more sample efficiency, unless you realize that your uh, Monte Carlo estimate is telling you uh, you should not trust TD. So basically for each state, you will also uh, compute the Monte Carlo uh, returns and even try to derive a confidence interval. And the more data you have, the the more uh, the, the the confidence interval for the value of that state using Monte Carlo return will shrink, and at some point, if you have um, states in which uh, TD 
is bootstrapping wrong values, you will be able to realize that you should not to do uh, temporal difference learning in the states and switch to Monte Carlo. So basically, uh, the illustration for this plot is the following. Uh, this is the confidence intervals calculated with Monte Carlo returns in blue for all of these states. And in, uh, in green, you have the TD estimate, right? So for the first, let's say, 10 states that S1 to SP, if there is a bias there, okay, they are wrong. So what, uh, but if you constructed this uh, confidence intervals for Monte Carlo regression, you should be able to detect, oh, this must be wrong with enough data and switch for these stages for Monte Carlo regression. That's exactly what our algorithm does, Adaptive TD. So if you see now the same plot as the beginning now with Adaptive TD, when you are doing tabular learning, you do almost as well as, as, as TD, a little bit less sample efficient, but still much more efficient than Monte Carlo regression. However, when you have the bias in which uh, the naive uh, TD suffers from independently on how much more data you have, the adaptive TD is now able to correct and pretty much uh, converts to the good solution and even faster than, uh, than MC. So, and that was for a very small perturbation to uh, what you would call function approximation, right? It's almost tabular learning, just affecting one state. But can you do also a similar thing if you are dealing with much more complex problems like with neural networks? Well, we try to study those in a setup in which we have this kind of um, 2D labyrinth in which uh, you have some, um, some green areas where you get a reward. You have some walls in which the agent cannot cross. And basically here we use the policy that is basic, is, ra is a random policy. It's basically um, a random walk, takes small steps. And, um, and uh, here we, with a lot of simulations, we compute what would be the true uh, value function for that random policy. So as you could see, if you are close to one of these uh, green targets, your expected return is much higher because you are likely to go there and bump into rewards. And the further you move away, because there is a discount factor in our setup, maybe 0 0.9 or 0 0.9, I don't remember, the expected return will be lower and lower and lower, right? And in the middle corridor, it's pretty low because the expected number of steps you need to take to get to these reward areas are quite big. And we had different layouts for this, uh, different configurations, we computed this ground truth uh, value functions with a lot of uh, simulations, like thousands of runs from each initial uh, starting point. And uh, one thing you can observe with neural networks that is related to that problem of propagating uh, estimation errors is the following. In a room like this, in which you, in a layout like this, in which you have two rooms, if you do Monte Carlo regression, uh, and you try to learn uh, this function from data, let's say from 50 rollouts, and then you compare it to the ground truth that we computed, you can uh, derive this heat map on uh, that encodes the errors, your prediction errors towards the ground truth. So basically, if you would be uh, green, it's, you are estimating pretty well, blue, you are underestimating, red, you are overestimating. With Monte Carlo regression, you see you are doing a pretty good job, especially in the upper room where there is zero rewards, you are more or less confident that there should be zeros everywhere. But you will notice that near the wall, there will be this um, mistake just because uh, neural networks will leak a bit towards the other side of the wall in the sense that there's not, you cannot learn that sharp discontinuity. So just because of your neural network um, uh, capacity and uh, smooth, inherently smoothness, you will overestimate a bit from the other side of the wall, okay? But the Monte Carlo regression is contained there. If you do TD learning, what will happen is what we call this leakage propagation problem, which is described in more detail in this other paper that we have. This will be further propagated to, to other regions of the state state, again, because you are updating a guess from a guess, like nearby states near the wall, will have this recur, uh, recurrent update rule in which they use uh, estimates from states that are closer to the wall and are suffering from that approximation error. And this will spread further and further. So this shows you 
that uh, this fragility, this problem will happen when you have function approximators. And what we did to try to overcome it was uh, use the same adaptive uh, temporal difference learning algorithm, but now we need a way to construct confidence intervals um, using neural networks. And to achieve so, there's a variety of methods, but the simple one we chose is using um, ensembles of neural networks. So you train M different neural networks, each of them with slightly uh, different uh, data sets. You can you do this bootstrapping of like sampling, let's say uh, two thirds of the trajectory with the uh, repetition and you train on that, maybe also with different initialization. So each of the M neural networks will uh, do slightly different predictions. And the intuition is that in regions in which all of them agree, you can be pretty confident that uh, the value is correct, right? Because all of them agree. In regions in which um, the neural network predictions in the ensemble, they differ, you should, be, you should have less confidence. So your uh, confidence interval is wider. So using that criteria, you can basically apply then the same adaptive TD algorithm in which you can decide per state whether you should do a TD update or a Monte Carlo update. And so we showed that again in this simple layout, if you compute the mean square value error of your value function approximation, um, you get a pretty good trade off. I mean, it's not obviously it's not as clear as in this the simple uh, kind of uh, near tabular approximation we showed in the beginning because computing confidence intervals with neural network ensembles is harder. But it's still a pretty good trade-off because with adaptive TD, if you don't know if you have enough data and um, which map layout you are, you will you'll get a pretty good trade-off compared to picking one of the alternatives MC or TD at, without any prior knowledge. So if you are interested in uh, learning more details about this, I encourage you to read the, our paper that appeared at NeurIP. This was with, done with colleagues from uh, DeepMind, uh, Google Brain in Zurich, and also a colleague from, uh, that works in the university in, in, um, in Barcelona. And you, there you see more results in other environments like Mountain Car and Atari Games. So as we are approaching the, the final uh, 10 minutes or so of our talk, I just want to conclude by giving you a few further pointers to applications and things and resources where you can learn more about these things. So one thing I want you to, to keep in mind is that uh, you can apply reinforcement learning con concepts progressively in, in your application if you have one in mind. So first of all, you have to identify if you have a sequential decision making process. So if there is a series of state and actions you need to take, and if there is a, a long-term metric you care about, like this sum of rewards, if that is the case, you can consider using RL. You can start by doing uh, what I call batch RL or offline off RL, which is try to use some of pre-existing collected data rather than trying to learn online, interacting, let's say, with the users of your recommender system or, or things which involve problems of um, safety or degradation of the experience of users. You can still start to do uh, batch reinforcement learning and use techniques like Monte Carlo regression, uh, which is very similar to basically supervised learning. Uh, if you just do this step, you are already optimizing for, for long-term metrics rather than short-sighted metrics, but it's still super stable like supervised learning. Then if your domain allows you and you have um, with, uh, more experience with uh, RL, you could try to do the, the temporal difference learning, right? Now you define a temporal difference loss and you can try to do this uh, bootstrapping. So maybe it would be more sample efficient, right? Uh, you could try to go further than that, which is uh, try to learn online, right? If you are very confident that you can interact with the environment without uh, uh, causing safety problems, or if you can tolerate doing some, um, some mistakes in the beginning, you could try to train online. And finally, you could also try to do exploration, which is try uh, new actions that you haven't evaluated just to collect more information. But all of this is like, you don't need to do all of them to, to start with RL, right? 
For example, uh, my uh, previous colleagues at, at DeepMind, they did uh, a few collaborations with products at Google in which this is what, basically what was done, right? So you might have heard about this data centers uh, cooling project in which Google has uh, these big data centers. There is a cooling system to, to extract uh, heat from the, um, the servers. And there's things you can control like uh, pumps to pump water or fans to, uh, to uh, extract uh, hot air and so on. And uh, your goal is to, you know, keep the data center at a reasonable operating temperature while minimizing the energy you use to operate the cooling system. So uh, what my colleagues did was, if you try to formulate this as a um, reinforcement learning problem in which uh, basically what you are optimizing for is uh, the energy usage should be low or well, they have defined the inverse measure, which is like how efficient they are. So they want to be more and more efficient. You can use historical data to just try to learn this uh, uh, Q function, this state action uh, value function in which you say, okay, given the operating policy that existed by the human operators, what is the expected efficiency or how much energy this will use in the next few hours um, and you will do exactly the thing, policy evaluation. And then you have an idea of how this um, policy will work. And maybe then you can start uh, giving suggestions to the operators to operate it more efficiently. Um, so that's pretty much what was done. And then you can gradually introduce uh, more direct control, more exploration once, once you have confidence that you can do it. Same thing applies to recommender systems, right? Like in a, we had projects with uh, shopping, play, and so on, in which uh, now the actions, instead of being these industrial controls, is more like um, things you recommend to the user, um, like app applications to install, or videos to watch, or products to shop, and so on. And you can, again, uh, use historical data to estimate the long-term value of things. And this is very important. This is, I encourage all organizations to do to do this, like YouTube had a few years back this problem that if you just optimize to uh, immediate clicks, you are likely to start showing just clickbait videos that are poor quality that maybe will lead the users to click on something. But in the long run, this degrades user experience. So maybe next week they will not use YouTube as much or so on, and they will consider it less useful for their lives. Whereas if you optimize for long-term metrics, like it, it would be naturally natural to do it in reinforcement learning, you can suggest high quality things that are satisfied the user in the long term. Okay, so, and because this is a conference uh, in which traditionally the uh, audience was interested in um, Java and JavaScript, I just wanted to point you to some things like, so you know that the deep learning community now is totally dominated by two libraries, which are TensorFlow and PyTorch, and they are both implemented in uh, C++, the underlying core of the library to be super efficient, uh, but they have an interface in Python so that people uh, write programs in Python and they can use all the, um, the other libraries for data visualization and so on that exist. However, uh, maybe some of you are more interested in Java and I noticed that there are a few uh, libraries now available. There used to be this Weka library that is, was very popular like 15 years ago it became less popular, but now they are also doing some deep learning. There's uh, the DL4J, and there's also one, I think, more recent one by Amazon, the Deep Java Library. And if, for those of you interested in JavaScript, there's also, this one is very well supported, there's also even TensorFlow JavaScript, in which you can uh, run TensorFlow directly in the browser. For uh, actually learning, reinforcement learning, uh, you can do it in the browser in, uh, at least two ways that I recommend. One is using this Google Python Cobol Labs. Again, it will be more Python and it's a client server architecture. So uh, the kernel can be running locally or in the cloud, even with the hardware acceleration. And for those of you, again, if you are interested more in like, languages like JavaScript, there's, for example, this library made by a researcher uh, called Reinforce.js, which natively is implemented in, in JavaScript and you can run it in the browser. I had a look at their web page and some things we can play with, like things I mentioned, like the tabular temporal difference learning, deep Q learning. 
there's implementations of this that you can run in the browser and it's, it's JavaScript. So if you are more familiar with those and you want to learn more, you can, you can just go ahead. All right, so to conclude, um, reinforcement learning is a framework for sequential decision-making process. It allows you to optimize for long-term metrics, can even go beyond human performance without human labels. And there are still many interesting fundamental research problems, but you can already apply some of those techniques in real systems. So yeah, go ahead and learn more about it, even inside your browser. All and right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so actually, one quick question. So if somebody uh, wants to get his, his or her hands dirty uh, and do their first small reinforcement learning project, what do you think could be a smart um, a good starting point, or uh, what, what? What should they do as a first step? Let's say. Exactly. So in this, um, in these uh, links here, uh, for example, uh, you can use one of these reinforced uh, JavaScript uh, libraries that you can run in the browser, or you, there, if you are more comfortable with Python, I encourage you to search for some of the uh, examples that you can find with the Colabs or Jupyter notebooks. For example, in simple environments like cart pool, in which there is a, a simple uh, cart with a pendulum that you need to control optimally to get rewards. There is examples with um, the QN, but they will uh, take a little longer to train. So it's better to start with the um, environments that are light, so they have low uh, dimensionality, so that you can iterate faster, right? Otherwise, for example, with the Atari games, maybe you have to wait a few hours to train. But if you start with things like card pull, in a few minutes, you'll see the results, right? All right. So there's a lot of tutorials like that. Perfect. Thank you. I think there are already some people who are eager to try it out. Um, and one maybe last question. How do you see, so what, well, what do you think are now the main struggles in reinforcement learning and the main blockers for the advancement in the field, so to say? Yeah, so in this talk, I don't mention too, too much that, but... Um, well, there, there are different problems, right? So one of them is uh, how do you do this uh, in the real world? So for example, the problem of safety. So if you have to learn directly with robots or you are trying to, let's say, train a self-driving car or things like that, uh, one of the components that reinforcement learning usually has is doing exploratory moves, trying, trying things out. Uh, you need to be aware of safety, right? You cannot just... Uh, do things that cause damage to your robot, or robot or people, or even in or even in recommender systems, you cannot just show poor recommendations. So you need to incorporate some uh, awareness of of the safety and the risks. Another uh, challenge is doing it more sample efficiently. So in some of the state of the art algorithms, they require like hundreds of millions of interactions in, uh, interactions with the environment. To, to learn properly. But if you are trying to do this more um, in domains, like in the real world, you would need to learn with much fewer data. Uh, so for example, there, there are techniques in which you learn partially in simulation and then you refine uh, with real data, things like that. So I think those are the main challenges. And in the beginning, I also mentioned that depending on your problem setup, like the dimensionality of your action space, your uh, state space, whether it's special observable or not, all of this can add complexity, whether you have sparse rewards or not, can cause more problems of exploration. So each domain, even for humans, right? Like if I put you in a new domain, which is you only observe part of the world, you don't get any feedback, <laughs> it's very complex, even for humans it will be hard, right? So this That's will true. also be exposed to algorithms. That's true. If you just take a look at how long a baby takes to learn about his environment, it's quite quite a long time. And and talking about that, actually, one last question. We have only one minute. Uh, how do you so how do you see reinforcement learning uh, in long term? Do you think it's a way to a more let's say general AI or something like that? Yeah. So I think reinforcement learning uh, it's a good way of formalizing the general artificial intelligence problem in the sense that. Uh, you have an agent that needs to make uh, decisions, uh, gets uh, interacts with the environment and gets uh, 
feedback from the, the environment as a, as a reward. So I think it's a pretty generic uh, formulation and it, it, you can represent uh, what is intelligent, intelligent behavior, I think, pretty well in this framework. But then the way you solve it might change a lot, right? And it might need a lot more components. I showed you this slide with the Agent 57, which is one of the state of the arts now. It already includes like 20 different techniques that were published initially in 20 independent papers and they all got together very carefully by research engineers at DeepMind to make things to make things work better, right? So, and the more you progress, the more you components you'll need to add, right? Like maybe you need to add some Bayesian learning. Maybe you need to incorporate symbolic learning. Maybe, you see, all of these components that uh, machine learning are treated somehow independently. Uh, to make better and better agents, you'd need to aggregate them into a single algorithm, right? <laughs> so that yeah. will take time. All right, Ugum, thank you so much for these 15 minutes. I hope that also you guys enjoyed it. Um, we'll be back in 10 minutes in this room of the next talk, and meanwhile, enjoy the break. Thank you, Ugum. Bye, and thank, thank you, everyone. You.